Good afternoon, I'm Jamie McCoy and I'm Knowledge Exchange Manager with AHDB Dairy in Wales. Today I'm joined by Keith Owen and Chris Duller, both of whom are agricultural consultants in Wales with areas of specialism which relate directly to nutrient storage and nutrient management on farms. So welcome to you both, thanks for being here. Afternoon. So why are we here today? Well, recently there's been an introduction of new um, agricultural pollution regulation in Wales, which relates specifically to water. And in fact, today is the first day of those regulations coming into force. So we know that since the announcement of the regulation, many dairy farmers have been worried about what this is going to mean for their business. Um, and we know that people are feeling concerned about how they're going to comply and whether they'll need to adapt their business in order to do so. So what we hope is that during today's session, we will be able to outline what the regulations are, when they're going to come into force, and that that will help people better understand what the changes will actually mean. So. Today is the 1st of April 2021. Um, if you're listening on catch up, then please do be aware that the content that we're covering today um, is correct to the best of our knowledge at this time. Um, of course, as we move through the transition period, things could change, new information, new templates, new tools might become available. So please do be aware that this specific session is designed to be an introductory session to understanding more about the new water regulation in Wales and AHDB are working at the moment to pull together further packages of support to help inform and help Welsh dairy farmers with this. So we can take questions throughout the webinar. We can't promise to answer every single question today. Um, this will be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of the new regulation, um, but we can offer more detailed sessions in the future on specific elements. AHDB have also worked on some frequently asked questions, which will be available on our website, so they're also going to be a good source of information. Um, to ask a question, you can use the question box, so um, it's in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. Use the little orange arrow to pop out the box and then type the question there. All attendees are muted um, and other webinar listeners can't see any of the questions you submit. So please do be assured you can ask anything confidentially. Um, so questions are welcomed in English or Welsh, but the language of the webinar will be English. And if you're registered with Dairy Pro and wish to collect your Dairy Pro points as a result of attending today's session, Please use the comment box, type in your name, address, email address and dairy pro number and we will register your points to you. So, without further ado, we will move straight into the presentations. Um, Keith is going to start by covering some of the building and the infrastructure elements um, that you'll need to consider. And then we'll come back to Chris afterwards, who's going to talk through the, the nutrient application elements of the regulation. So, Keith, over to you. I'll let you introduce yourself. And I think Chris and I will come off camera and see you shortly. OK, afternoon. Um, my name's Keith Owen. I work for Quebec. Uh, my background is delivery on farm infrastructure advice looking at improvements on farm buildings or slurry storage so uh, what i'm going to go through today is basically how the new control of pollution regulations have changed what is currently in place and how it will affect people um, i will look at the different types of storage and what you're going to need to consider i'll go through what other issues you need to include when you're calculating slurry storage etc including sort of contaminated rainfall what's classed as slurry what isn't classed as slurry i'll also talk about the farmyard manure in the first section <clears throat> the reason uh, chris and i do it this way around is basically if you can't hold the volumes you're producing the spreading of it is you know difficult to achieve your nutrient levels when you're when you're spreading them out so you need to get your sort of infrastructure and yard works in place initially before you can control what you're actually spreading out 
So the new control of pollution regulations, they've come in as of today. So what do you need to consider and what does it affect? It basically affects slurry storage, how you hold it, what the facilities are. It also includes silage clamps, effluent tanks. Now, the difference between the current regs, which finished yesterday, and the new regs that start today is relatively minimal from this from the side of looking at you know storage requirements and facilities. <clears throat> the main difference now is whereas previously you had to employ in inform NRW 14 days at once you uh, 14 days after you'd finished whatever you were building, now you've got to inform 14 days before you start work. Now that m makes a lot more sense from their point of view and yours because if if you're informing them 14 days before you finish and the facility isn't up to standard obviously it's a little bit late so they've changed that to 14 days before you start uh, so that you if there are any issues you can address them you know before you start building the thing the standards of construction are the same as before <clears throat> so you've still got to construct it to this bs5502 i'll go into more detail on that a little bit later on you still need to provide a WQE3 form to be signed off. That basically shows that the structure has been built to standard. <clears throat> that form may change uh, as, as things move on, but at the moment, it looks like it's, it's the same kind of form as a WQE3, which means it needs to be signed off by somebody suit to be qualified. Basically, whoever's built it has to have experience or is a structure engineer, et cetera, or somebody who's suit to be qualified to build the structure. Planning permission, more often than not, is also required. Okay. One of the main sort of confusing issues uh, with regard to what slurry and what's not, are the, what they sort of class as likely fouled runoff. Now, that effectively boils down to parlor washings that have got a high dilution factor or clamp runoff during the winter period, which is also highly dilute and less of a pollution risk. Um, I'll talk more in detail about that as I get onto the silage clamps. The other thing that comes up a lot with regarding what is slurry, what isn't, and the difference between FYM and slurry. Farmyard manure or stackable farmyard manure is not classed as slurry. However, if it's stored outside, the runoff is. So that will need to be collected. Again, I'll go into more detail of this as we go through, but this is just to give you a brief overview of what, what the regulations entail. The main difference now will be the close spreading period, but this won't come in until August 24, 1st of August 24, but there will be a close spreading period where slurries cannot be spread out to the land. And there's the requirement of a nutrient management plan, which Chris will cover in more detail in his section. So what you need to think about from, from now on effectively. So any slurry store that you are considering building or additional slurry storage that you may want to add to the storage you've already got will need to achieve five months storage capacity. That's from the 1st of uh, August 24. So if you've got existing storage and you know you're, you're you're struggling for capacity over that winter period, you need anything you build from now on needs to you need to aim to get to this five months overall capacity. And that will be six months for pigs and poultry. So effectively, you are looking to store everything classed as slurry within your storage system from the 1st of October to the 1st of March or 1st of April with pigs and poultry. With regard to a slurry storage facility, it sounds obvious, but you know you need to make sure that the facility is impermeable, i.e. it doesn't leak. One of the main considerations that is all, all, quite often miscalculated and not taken into account as much as it should is that Calculations must include all your contaminated yard runoff that is classed as slurry. So any surface rainfall going into that store or any contaminated yard runoff from yards used by stock for loafing or feeding or a yard you may scrape across, that is also classed as slurry. Now that can make a massive difference to the volumes you need to collect and contain. 
if you've got any likely foul runoff that isn't isolated and separated, i.e. the power washings or clamp runoff, if those are contaminated by slurry, they also are classed as slurry. So all these things need to get taken into consideration when you're calculating the volumes your farm is producing. The other thing that needs to be taken into account is the five month surface rainfall figure that falls onto these yards and onto the slurry store. Now there's a website link there that will give you your five month winter's rainfall. Uh, so you can type in your postcode into that and that will tell you what your five month rainfall will be. So that is the figure you then use to base your calculations on. Okay, it's important that that is taken into account because that can make a massive difference to what you're thinking of building or you know your existing capacities. Any new slurry store, as was previously, needs to be built 10 meters from a water course, 50 meters from a borehole or drinking water source. Now, the big issue that is that often confuses farmers when they're calculating the size of the slurry store and is often missed out are the fee board for these types of storage systems. If you're calculating the capacity of your existing store or a proposed store that you're thinking of building, you must take into account the fee board. So if you've got a concrete store or a tin tank, effectively the first foot, the first 300 millimeters of that store should always be left free of slurry. And that must be maintained as a free board. On an earth banked lagoon, that increases to 750 millimeters. That is taken from the lowest boundary point. So if you've got an entrance ramp or a low point on the embankment, that is where your free board should always be taken from. Now that can make a huge difference to your capacity. Because if you've got three foot of rain and you've got two and a half feet of free board on an earth bank lagoon, that's five and a half foot of your capacity that's already taken out of the equation. But it's important that those things are calculated into your calculations when you're working out how much you're producing and how much storage you'll require. That is the type of thing NRW will be looking at when it comes to looking at capacities. So they'll want to see that you've got adequate storage or you've got a plan of how you're going to get to adequate storage by the 1st of August 24. The safety fence is still as it was before. That's still a requirement around the boundary of the slurry store. So these are your basic options uh, for slurry storage. You've got your earth bank lagoon, you've got your above ground tin tank, and you've got your concrete slurry store. Uh, with regard to the earth bank lagoon, prior to construction, you need to test the soils to check for impermeability. Um, Ideally, you need above sort of 18 to 20 percent of clay content in the soil, and that will achieve impermeability without the need for a liner. However, if you can't get to that clay content in the soil, then you need to consider a liner for for the store. So additional slurry storage capacity can include existing storage volume. OK, so if you've got an existing store that can also be included in the storage calculation. So if you've got three months storage there now, you know, you can include that in the, in the future calculation when you show how you're going to get to the five month storage. <laughs> there is still the exemption on pre-1991 stores, so anything that was built pre-1991 was classed as exempt from the SAFO regs, which have just been superseded by the new regs. So if you had a pre-91 store, you could still use that store and empty it previously. Now, the exemption can still apply and you can still use that store as part of your overall storage capacity, but you now need to achieve the five months by the 1st of August, 24. So your existing storage can be used if you've got a pre-91 store, that needs to be structurally sound and fit for purpose. So, you know, if you have got an old store, you just need to check that that store is up to up to the job effectively. Then you can include the volumes collected within that store. So 
once completed, you will need to get to the total storage capacity plus existing if you have to achieve this five or six month storage, depending on what you're housing. Plus what I've mentioned previously of all the freeboard, etc. So then this will give you effectively control of the slurry for the five months and you'll have a two month boundary outside the close period theoretically so if the weather isn't if you can't spread after the end of the close period on the 15th of jan you should have a two month buffer of storage where you can wait until you know you, you can control the spreading so you can maximize the nutrient use there is limited spreading after the 15th of jan to the end of feb so you're talking about a max of 30 meters cube per hectare for slurry and a maximum of eight tons per hectare of poultry manure but that runs up until then the, the end of feb these are just some example pictures of places that i've seen you know where obviously there's a limited storage capacity they can't hold it for the winter period so you end up with overflow and this is you know the exact problem everybody's trying to address with regards to the pre-91 stores, there has been a lot of storage failures recently. I've been to three personally where there is these older stores are starting to come to the end of their life. You know, even if you had a store put in in the early 90s, you know, they were designed with a 20 year life without maintenance. So some of these are coming to the end of their life. So whilst you may have them, you know, is it cost effective to include them or is it better to look at a, you know, a complete new store? But, you know, that's a judgment call you need to make on the structure you've got. Um, as a guideline, you know, if, if you are thinking of increasing storage capacity, this is a rough guideline of to how much these things cost to build. So a new concrete store, shuttered concrete store, you're looking at about 80 meters, 80 pounds per meter cubed for every meter cubed of material you store. Now that isn't just slurry, that includes everything else that's going into it as we described earlier. For an above ground circular tank, it's between 47 to 57 per meter cubed. But as you can see, an earth bank lagoon is by far the cheapest option. Now there's obviously pros and cons to all of them. You collect more rainwater in the earth bank lagoon, you've got a bigger freeboard, you know, your pumping costs could be more over a long period of time because you're pumping more rain. But you know that's a judgment call based on the systems you've got and what you can install if you have to add a line there to the earth bank lagoon then you're looking at an additional 12 to 15 pound per square meter of surface area uh right this is the important thing you know that you need to consider because whilst everybody calculates the slurry accurately based on the cow numbers it's always the contaminated rainfall that increases the volumes of storage required massively okay so all contaminated rainfall so all the rainfall that falls onto what would be classed as dirty yards so that's a scrape yard feed yard loafing yard or a stock or a yard that stock of ad lib access to will be classed as slurry so that rainfall figure over the winter period multiplied by the surface area of the yard can make a huge difference okay so all that contaminated rainfall would need to be collected and contained within the slurry store. So as I said earlier, then all existing and proposed, if you're combining them, need to have the capacity to contain all the winter's contaminated rainfall off these yard areas. If stock are traveling on yards to get from A to B and it's controlled traveling, as in they haven't got free access, then that can be classed and taken out of the equation as a clean yard but it's got to be well maintained. So it's all about the management of that area. As I said earlier, probably over half the farms and closer to three quarters produce more contaminated surface rainfall than they actually produce slurry from the stock. So preventing the contamination of rainfall is the long-term most cost-effective way to increase your available slurry storage. Every square meter of yard you can take out of the equation will buy you additional storage in your existing store so you know there's the benefit of reducing spreading costs and reducing dilution of the product but if you were thinking of investing in slurry storage by the 1st of august 24 preventing the contamination of rainfall will reduce the cost of that slurry store 
and it's a far you get far more bang for your buck getting the rainfall out than you do just building a bigger store because you're getting hit on both sides then not only are you building a bigger store that store's collecting more surface rainfall so your spreading costs are going to go up that's an estimation of what effectively goes into your lagoon why you might work it out as the amount of slurry produced by the stock that's roughly about 30 percent of what actually goes into the store if you're collecting your parlor washings and your rainwater on yards etc you can see there it adds up to a hell of a lot more so these are examples of yards roofed you know if you can get some of the areas that are classed as dirty yards under cover long term it'll be beneficial and it will save you money so the benefit of roofing it reduces the slurry that's produced it will reduce your overall spreading costs you get a like for like gain in your storage basically you know whatever you can cover you're getting free additional storage in your existing store it reduces the additional cost of the slurry store as i said and you do get an asset value of a building which you don't you know not necessarily get with a hole in the ground I know everybody talks about the benefit of guttering and you, you probably heard it all before, but in the situation we're in now, when you're looking for additional storage, every roof area you can divert before that water falls on a dirty yard will benefit you. So I've just shown a quick example here of just your average roof, your 100 by 60 shed, you'll find on most farms, just a small piece of broken down pipe or guttering will send that water onto a dirty yard. Once that rainfall touches the dirty yard, that is then slurry and you've got to collect it and contain it. So on an average rainfall of 800 mil over the five months, that's well 432 cubic meters of contaminated rainfall that you have now got to collect, store and spread. So that equates to about 95,000 gallons. That's 63 trips on a 1500 gallon tanker so that's you know that's a lot of time money fuel labor cost so you know at five pound a cube to spread you're looking at about two two over two grand so you know it does make sense if you've got a 15 quid broken bit of gutter in that you can replace it's a lot cheaper to do that than look at additional storage spreading costs and how all this adds up okay so I would strongly suggest that's the first place you start reduce the dirty water and it will help you get to where you need to be with the storage capacity when you get inspections from nrw they will be looking at what is classed as dirty water what falls onto yards so they will look at these calculations so they will you know work it out as well um i'll just quickly go through fym heaps effectively if you if you're storing loose housed bedded material on an open yard all runoff from that is classed as slurry so if you've got a large open yard area collecting three foot of rain you have then got to provide storage for that volume uh, so the, the long and the short of it is you either keep it under cover or you can still take it out to temporary field heaps under the new regs that's just an example of a covered store. Once it's under cover, it's muck. There's no contamination of surface rainfall then, so it's stackable. You can keep it under cover and you can spread that throughout the closed period then, as long as the land and weather conditions are suitable. I'll just whiz through silage clamp because time's ticking on you. Um, basically, this comes in from now. This isn't of 20, uh, August 24, this is from the 1st of April. So if you're building a new clamp or thinking of building a new clamp, this applies from now. But there has effectively been no change from the SAFO regs previously. So if you're building a clamp, a clamp is a clamp. It doesn't matter if it holds maize or treated feeds. It's still a clamp under the regulations and it needs to comply. As with the slurry store, it needs an impermeable floor slab. Still needs to be 10 metres from a water course, 50 metres from a borehole or drinking water source. It has to have a boundary channel around the outside of the facility. If it's a new clamp, it needs a channel around the outside of the walls, okay? It neither needs to be directed to an effluent tank, which is based on the capacity of the clamp. I'll show you an example later on. Or you can direct it to the slurry store. But if it's an open clamp, that slurry store needs to collect five months surface rainfall off that clamp. Now that makes a huge difference to the capacity you're going to require. Because once that clamp runoff 
becomes contaminated by slurry, it's classed as slurry. If you can separate and store clamp runoff in an effluent tank, you can spread that during the closed period as likely fouled, because by the time you get to the 1st of October, there shouldn't be a lot of effluent production, the dilution factor will be a lot higher. So that's an example of a compliant clamp, boundary channel on the outside, linked to an effluent tank. That's an effluent tank prior to being installed. So, you know, if you, it's a lot cheaper to install a new effluent tank than to increase your slurry storage to take the volume off the surface area. Plus, it reduces your spreading cost by miles. So, if you've got an average clamp 50 by 30 meters collecting 800 mil of rain again, that's 264,000 gallons of additional storage you're going to need to find in the slurry store. Okay, so that's potentially six grand of extra spreading costs. If you're to put it into an effluent tank, the tank would only need to have 34 cubic meters to comply. And that could be linked to a ring gun and spread to the land as likely fouled, as long as it's isolated and separated. Now it makes far more sense and is more cost effective to do that. If you've got a roof clamp, obviously the equation, the equation changes because the rainfall is intercepted anyway. So the most common problems we've got with clamps, and these apply, these apply to clamps that have been built since 91, because they should be compliant as well. So if you've built the clamp since 1991, it should already be compliant. So the most common faults I find are basically the lack of external channel, lack of adequate or sufficient effluent collection, whether it be to the store or to a, a effluent tank. The wall strength often is a, you know, it hasn't been calculated properly. The biggest one are earth bank clamps. If you've built an earth bank clamp since 1991, it's non-compliant and they are non-compliant now. Okay, so if you're thinking of putting an earth bank silage clamp in, it won't be compliant. You need to get it designed so it complies with the new regulations. Adapting existing clamps to achieve compliance, especially earth banks are, are difficult, but it can be done, but it's not simple. So it's worth looking at how you're gonna put the clamp in initially rather than just go for it and then worry about the problem later. These are just a few examples of clamps that have failed. You know, they look fine, especially the top two. No boundary channel on the top left. So that was, they weren't allowed to use that until a, a boundary channel was put in place. The top right has an earth embankment along one side, no collection channel in the front. So that's illegal. It shouldn't be used. Bottom left, that's non-compliant for obvious reasons, effluent seeping through the wall floor joint, although the guy fixed that for next to nothing just by putting the channel around the outside. It was a cheap fix, but it, you know, it looks the worst clamp. The bottom right is effectively just simply non-compliant. It's, it's got a permeable flow, earth bank, no control of effluent. That would basically just be condemned. So, these are the sort of dates you need to think about for the storage and the new regs, just to pre-see what I've been talking about. Um, silage clamps have got to be compliant from today, and they're no change from SAFO. NRW need to be informed 14 days before commencement of works of any of facilities you're thinking of building between now and August 24. Compliance with the storage of organic manure, including temporary fields, has to come in from the 1st of January 23. So that's for your FYM. Six months or five months storage for slurry, six for pigs and poultry. That has to be in place by the 1st of August 24. And the closed periods for spreading of slurry, that's enforced from the 1st of August 24. So those are the dates re relating to the infrastructure and the structures. Now, I know I sort of whizzed through that because I know Jamie's on a tight line, but I think, you know, Jamie's considering looking at the Q and A at a different time. If we can't get through all the questions, and we can go through it all in more detail, but that basically covers what uh, the, the structures on the yard and any new facilities. So I think Chris is going to look at the next bit of the spread into the land and the application side of it. Okay, I hope that helped. That's perfect. Thank you, Keith. And I think there's. A few things there that are perhaps quite reassuring for people, you know, no huge changes um, from immediately from today. There's time to think about what amendments might need to be made to things like storage. Um, and yeah, I suppose 
a thing to consider as maintenance and when it's possible to do that, isn't it? Because it's not yeah. if there's slurring in something or a silage in a clump, you can't necessarily um, do your maintenance. So yeah, thinking ahead is always key there. I think. Uh, uh, just one thing, um, Jamie. I think the thing to have as long as long as you have a plan of how you're going to get from A to B, I think NRW will be sympathetic with what you're thinking of doing. But you know that they need to see that you've got this plan of right. I've got three years. This is where I am. This is where I'm going to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. And um, we did have a couple of questions, which I'll come to straight away. So, Keith, could you just remind us of the freeboard um, measurements, please? So what was the freeboard requirement for the tin tank above ground? Right. For, for, for a tin tank and a concrete store, it's 300 millimetres from the top. So effectively, you shouldn't fill it up to within 300 mil of the top of the store. On a earth bank lagoon, it's two and a half feet, but it's from the lowest point. You, you often see, even on concrete stores, they, they'll they take 300 mil from the top of the wall, but it's often the ramp in is a lot lower. So you need to take it from the lowest boundary point, okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we've also got a comment saying that um, somebody thought that earth bank clamps were still compliant, provided there was an impermeable floor which extended beyond the base of the earth bank. Yeah, and yeah. You, the you, can, drain. you can get earth bank clamps that can be designed with the floor going under the bank to the outside. So you've got an impermeable drain around the outside, but that they are effectively new, new structures. So yes, you, you can build an earth bank clamp, but the, the floor goes under the bank all the way through which you know most people will dig into a into a bank and just create a clamp but they're, they're quite rare to be honest the the, the actually compliant earth bank clamps then i've probably seen two okay okay and then one final one on this topic then what do people need to bear in mind when locating the temporary field heap the farmyard manure well you you just need to be obviously location you need to keep it away from tracks and fields you, you don't want to get runoff seeping onto tracks and pouring away you don't want to go on anything too steep so you know bear in mind where the the fall of the land is going to and how it's going and where it's going to go if it does run off if you've got sort of um poultry manure uh, or that doesn't contain any bedding you should cover it with a tarpaulin as well, okay? But the location, obviously, you need to be away from watercourses, ditches, borrow, same, you know, it, it, it's a lot of common sense. You can you, you you can leave there for one year, you can go to a new location, and then you can go to another location, but you can't go back to that spot for a three-year spell effectively. So you can't continue on that one spot. So you've got to you've got to move it. And I think they're gonna ask for that. Chris may cover this now, they're gonna be asking for that on the on the management plan so you let need to show where your heaps are going yeah pick that up yeah okay excellent right i think that hands really nicely on to you then chris you can talk to us about sort of the nutrient management and where we can use these where and how we can use the nutrients produced on farm then thank you keith yeah, afternoon everyone. Yeah, Keith's had the easy bit. Um, mine sort of flits all over the place a little bit. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Della, independent consultant. I've been on farm now, <laughs> nagging at people for nearly 25 years. Um, so it, it kind of pushes the nags, you know, normally I'd be talking about return on investment and looking after nutrients, all right, with an eye on pollution, but a lot of the, the, the direction was about improving production. Now we've really got to have that focus back on, on the regulation side of things um so yeah a, a little whistle stop tour of what's coming through between now and august 2024 um my section really is, is all about the spreading issues and some of the paperwork requirements associated with um all the field operations for some of you it will literally just be a bit of a change to do with paperwork um for others it could be a fairly significant change in terms of your stocking regimes um as keith says you know we've got two and a half three years to, to get to grips with it um i urge you all you know get some help and advice as soon as you can if you need it um certainly don't don't ignore what's coming um 
so realistically, the regulations are going to affect how we plan and record what we do with both manure and fertilizer um, in terms of how we spread it. So there's going to be um, actions required to minimize risk of runoff and leaching from nitrogen fertilizers, um, and also in terms of organic manures, um, actions required to prevent it going upwards as ammonia loss. So at the minute, the man in the ammonia office um, is stamping his little feet more and more, uh, particularly with the introduction of more and more poultry and pig units. Um, the other big one, I guess, that's going to hit for most people is the, the 170 limit. Um, so in England, they've had a 250 kilos of N derogation. In Wales, we've decided on a fixed 170. And that's basically uh, the amount of nitrogen that falls out the back of your cows. Um, so it, it's very much a book figure, and it works on the amount of um, manure and, uh, and urine that falls out of a cow some of which you'll spread, but some of which the animals will spread. Um, and I'll take you through that calculation later on. So as from um, 1st of April, we start and say the, the regs start to come in. For those of you already in an MVZ, everything applies already. So there is no transition period for you guys. As from today, we have tighter controls on the spreading of manufactured fertilizer. Um, we have some regulation now on incorporation of organic manure, primarily slurry and poultry, but also including some farm manure as well. Um, and we have some closed periods for spreading manufactured fertilizer. I'll take you through these. To be honest, there's nothing in this immediate release of regulation that is much different from what was really there under cross compliance. So in terms of Actions to reduce losses from manufactured fertilizer. The regs say that before spreading, you should go out and inspect your field. Now, at 280 pound a ton for your fertilizer at the minute, nobody's really spreading fertilizer um, too often in dodgy conditions. But it is about just making that conscious effort to go, okay, where are my areas where fertilizer is likely to move? So it's looking at um, ground cover in particular, you know, especially when we're, we're looking at this time of year when soil temperature is still fairly low, grass hasn't got growing yet. Um, so losses, you know, drains are still running in many situations, soils are a bit wet. This is the sort of time when these decisions need to be made. You know, if it's your farm and you know your ground really well, it's easy. But if you've got contractors coming in to spread fertilizer, then this sort of approach of, of basically identifying risks, making sure they know where land drains are, making sure they know the fields that you've mole plowed or subsoiled recently. Those are the decisions that they want you to take and put in the diary that says, okay, we've made this conscious decision. You know, watch the weather forecast. Um, often it won't be about the whole field. It'll be a, but just about saying, okay, well, the bottom area of that field is close to the, the, the brook or there's a steep slope there. You know, anything that just means that you have to take that conscious decision to, to look at a risk assessment before you spread. I say, as far as I'm aware, most people will do that as, as standard anyway. The next step really is just about recording that and making sure it goes in the diary that says, yes, we've had a look, forecast is fine, we'll crack on. Um, you know, I say, everything here existed in cross compliance before. So the idea of not spreading on frozen ground, um, not allowing your fertilizer to come within two meters of a surface water. And if you're spreading manures, we need to have the 10 meters between you and the ditch, which drops to six meters if you're using um, injector, training shoe, drill bar. The other one that's um, coming in relates to the incorporation of organic manure into bare stubble. And it's been something we've been talking about for years, the idea of, hang on, we shouldn't be going out, particularly on things like maize ground and plastering it in the, in the autumn and leaving it on the surface um, because it's likely to move. So the regulation now is that if you're spreading on bare stubbles, uh, bare soil, you should incorporate your slurry or poultry manure or the liquids within 24 hours. Um, so that will reduce the ammonia loss and also reduce the, the risks of it running, particularly think down things like wheel marks. Um, if it's gone on with a dribble bar, that doesn't have to apply. The other situation is for any organic manure, so that'll be your solids as well. If the land is within 50 meters of the surface water or slopes so that runoff might be a risk, then you should be incorporating it. Um, so, you know, the, the picture I've put up is a maize field, low lying area, 
can be subject to winter flooding, that would class as a risk area um, and that should be incorporated. So it will be a change um, to what we do in, in the autumn um, just to make sure that we reduce those losses both from runoff and from ammonia. There will be an introduction of closed periods for spreading fertilizer. Um, the impacts of these are going to be minimal because most of you won't be spreading in the closed periods anyway. In terms of grassland, that closed period, according to the book, now runs from the 15th of September to the 15th of January. But there is an exemption for grassland that says you can actually carry on spreading through September and October um, up to 80 kilos of ends, but in no more than 40 at one go. That's if you can justify a crop demand, a conditions allow for minimal risk of loss. So for those of you measuring grass, you'll know that we're still seeing responses um, through the autumn. We're getting growth rates of 30, 40 kilos of dry matter a day through September. So in that case, we can justify a response. Um, you know, if it's an old field that's knackered and it's full of Yorkshire fog and it's compacted and the pH is on the floor, your response isn't going to be good. So it's not somewhere that we would justify going out. Um, and in my eyes, that would fit that um, closed period perfectly um, because we can't really justify um, an application there because there will be no significant growth and it will be lost. So those are the requirements that are from today. And I say, I don't think there's anything major to what most people are doing already. Probably the incorporation of organic manure on your stubbles and bare ground is, is the biggest one. Then we come into 1st of January, 2023. Um, they would like you to produce a risk map for all your spreading activities on the farm. That includes your muck and your, your fertilizers. Some of you will be already doing this through farm assurance, um, but it's just tightening up on that. So I'll run you through that. Um, we need to think about spreading methods and as we've already talked about field heaps, I guess the biggest one is the 170 kilos N, which we'll run through, which you need to record. And there's some limits on individual field limits in terms of how much we can apply from manure and how much we can apply from fertilizer. The requirement will be for a nitrogen management plan. Um, for some reason, they've decided not a nutrient management plan. We're not interested in PK. Um, as it states, um, the guidance is all about making sure we know what, what's happening with your nitrogen. I'm not saying don't do a full nutrient management plan because you know there's there's tons of reasons we should be looking at PK as well, both economically and from pollution point of view. But the regs as they stand say that you have to have a nitrogen management plan. This is your typical risk map. So we're going through identifying areas on the farm, be they whole fields or part of fields um, that are close to watercourses, that may have slopes, that may be close to boreholes. So we can define across the farm the areas that are low risk and those that are high risk and also those that are a no spread zone. And again, this is something that shouldn't just sit in a filing cabinet. These sort of risk maps are the sort of thing that I'd like you to pass to your contractor and say, look, you know, here's my farm, here's my risk maps. And they say, they'll change. You know, if you go out and um, subsoil in the autumn, a field, then that changes its risk status from maybe a low risk into a, a very high risk area. So those need to be continually recorded and go on your, your, your risk map. Um, it's an exercise that we can do sitting down kitchen table with a highlighter pen and we run through looking at contour lines and um, and soil types and say just picking out where those water courses and ditches are. Let's say we need to show all those surface waters, the boreholes, any shallow soils, your slopes, um, where we've got land drains and also on that map as Keith says we'll go um, your temporary field heaps and they should always be on on the green bits, they'll be on the low risk um, areas. The other one that's going to hit some people will be we are no longer allowed to jet it over the hedge. Um, so the, the jetters will be outlawed as such, and all your splash plate spreaders should not project above that four meter upwards. Um, we're still allowed to use the um, the Briggs irrigators um, as long as they're sited on the low risk areas, um, and there's a limit on the the application rates that they can run at. Um, but yes, the primary um, reason for this is going to be the ammonia loss associated with the, the idea of spreading your um, slurry up in the air. Um, we've 
ticked off the, the field heaps. Um, as Keith says, they need to move around the farm, don't keep them in the same place. Now, this is the, the real nightmare one, and we could spend an hour and a half on this. Um, so I'm going to try and whiz you through it. The 170 limit is going to be a killer for some farms, and it will mean significant changes to how the business operates. It's got nothing to do with how much fertilizer you use. Um, application rates is purely a figure based on calculation to do with your stocking regimes and your land area. Um, it can also be influenced, obviously, then by how much muck either comes on or goes off. So at the minute, some people have been pulling in digestate or poultry manure and the like um, to supplement um, their nutrients, and that needs to be recorded. It will be a retrospective calculation. So although it comes in on 1st of January 2023, it will be based on your farm activities right way through 2022. So it's something we need to get hold of now. Um, certainly in England, the, the general regime is that your, your calculation, you kind of review it in the summer to make sure that by the time we get to the 1st of January, we're somewhere on target. Um, there's nothing worse than having a nasty surprise halfway through December when you do the sums and you suddenly find, hang on a minute, I'm well over um, and non-compliant. So it's something that we need to have a, a sort of rolling calculation and really look at it as early as we can. So Welsh Government have published tables. Basically, every animal on your farm produces a set amount of nitrogen, basically what falls out the back. And we know that ruminants are horribly inefficient and that 70 or 80 percent of the nitrogen we put in the front end falls out the back end. Um, the categories are pretty broad. So if you've got a cow producing between six and nine thousand litres every year, she produces 101 kilos of N. At a lower yield left, if, she, if she's under six thousand, it's 77. So it's quite a big disparity um, between the groups. And on a simplistic basis, we can go through and add up the number of cows you've got, um, the number of months they're on the farm and, and produce a nitrogen figure for that animal. We also need to calculate um, anything going off farm. Um, I say it's it's about what volume is going off. It doesn't need to be a detailed contract unless you're with um, an AD supply. But if you're taking 10 tanker loads down to a neighbour, as long as it says on his paperwork that he's had 10 tanker loads, um, that's, that's all we need as such, um, so that it, it goes in both both sets of figures. Um, I say, it, for that to work in the whole calculations, we need to know how much has gone off and the nitrogen content of it and where it's gone to. So okay, if so I've got, got a question here, yeah. if you don't if you don't mind. Um, so the Welsh government tables that have been produced, if a farmer chooses to sample their slurry and that measures differently to what is assumed in the table, does that alter what they're able to apply? Not for this, no. This is based on animal production, so no. In terms of sampling your slurry, if you're exporting, yes, you can sample your material that's going off farm, and if it is higher than the book figure, you can state that figure. Um, there's a whole set of criteria for how we um, confidently test slurry and manure to get an accurate figure. Um, but yeah, theoretically we can do that, um, but not for the actual, what comes out the back of an animal in terms of this table here. Um, that's set as is. But when it comes to the export table, yes, we can put our own, our own figures in there. Okay, so if I've got from the table, the amount of nitrogen coming out the back end of my cows, and I've added or taken away my nitrogen that's gone off or come onto farm, and then it's basically dividing it by the farm forage area. That's not dividing it by the spreadable land, it's, it includes you know, all the grazing area. So the only thing I exclude from that are hard standings um, and things like ungrazed woodland. So in reality, I can put in um, summer grazing, I can put in common land, now, anything an animal has access to that will have a, a deposition of N that comes out of the system. Now, this table I shout out on a regular basis. Um, if you're milk recording, you'll have enough data for every animal on your farm to be able to put them in the right box and say, yeah, that cow does 8,700 litres and she, she allocates 115 kilos of N. 
if you're not milk recording, you can enter the average. So you can say, okay, with 7,000 litre herd, on average, every cow is producing 7,000 litres, they're all at 101. Or you can fine tune it to a certain degree, maybe to take account of younger first carvers coming into the system. Um, so I've done an example here, 300 cow herd. If I put the figures in as, you know, I'm, I'm averaging 7,000 litres, if I put the average in and divide it by my 166 hectares, I'm over the limit by 13, it comes out 183. But if I put 30% of my herd in as young animals below 6,000 litres, then I can meet the target. So there is a certain amount of flexibility within it. And I would start with the point to all of you and say, well, work it out on the average. And if you're at 210, then I'm afraid there's not a lot we can do, even with this sort of slight tweaking. If I'm at that 185 and under, I think there's probably room with a, a decent consultant to, to find some way of just tweaking you around. I say the difference in this would be the difference between a farm taking on about another 35 acres of ground to reduce that kilograms of N per hectare. So it's something that I'd say, do the sums now, see where you are um, and get a rough ballpark. And I say, there'll be plenty of farms that are in that 180, 190, 200-ish. Um, what we do, well, if you're over, we either buy or rent more land to increase the forage area. Now, just be aware that, you know, everybody's going to be in the same position. There'll be a lot of people chasing additional land, um, which, you know, was obviously impact on, on rental values and, and land values. The other way around is we reduce the nitrogen that we allocate to the stock. So we either drop our stock numbers, we reduce yields. So I talked about moving from that six to nine thousand litre bracket and getting more of your cows under six thousand litres you could sell your young stock earlier so particularly for those with, with beef animals the longer you keep that animal they can move into that next bracket um you know if i've got animals over 18 months old they're all producing nitrogen if they were sold earlier we'd lower our nitrogen regime you could end up looking at things like running a flying herd or a heifer rearing arrangement whereby your heifers go off come in from another farm so they're out of your equation or you could look to export nitrogen away from the farm um, to other land so you know the expense of exporting has got to come into that how far are we going to take it and where am I going to take it to and I say wherever I take it to it needs to go on their paperwork that they're receiving it as well there are issues in terms of biosecurity and I'm sorry you know in the TB area, there are going to be restrictions about what you can do with your manure. Certainly, we're not going to be putting it on grazing ground. There will be restrictions about where we can take it to. In addition to that 170 limit, there are all sorts of other little bits and pieces coming in terms of calculation. One of them is, is actually a figure that's already existed for, for many years, the 250 kilos of N um, from manures in terms of the total nitrogen content. So we have a book figure for cattle manure and cattle slurry. We know how much nitrogen is in it in total. So that's the organic and the available. And we need to make sure that we're not oversupplying and exceeding that 250 kilos of N from organic material in a calendar year. For most of you, it won't be an issue. So if we look at average slurry, 6%, you know, you can nearly put 100 cube on before you hit that limit. And there's not many people I know that are putting on, on 100 cube um per field some might on a multi system might get fairly close so it's one just to be aware of and that will need to be seen in your manure management plan um so here if, if you produce 500 um, 5000 cube um and you've got 500 ton of fym that gives me a total nitrogen supply from that manure and slurry of 16,000 kilos so I divide that by 250 and I need 64 hectares of spreading land. And again, when we were working on that 170 limit, I was talking about forage area and grazed land. When I'm doing my sums on the 250, all I can include is my spreading area. So from that 64 hectares, I've had to ignore all my no spread zones, my steep slopes, my buffer zones close to rivers. Um, in addition, in reality, you should also take out, you know, the, the, the ground that you're not you know spreading on maybe some of the, the grazing platform that doesn't get spread 
Um, but in reality, we need to make sure that that 250 kilos of N um, goes on your paperwork. So the requirement now for a nitrogen management plan, um, it's going to be a document which hopefully will main just, just match up the land resources with, with the manure and fertilizer application and reduce the risks of it going anywhere else. Um, hopefully as well as just, I don't want it something that just sits in a filing cabinet waiting for an inspection. It should help you improve recovery from the manure that you're applying. It should help you reduce purchase fertilizer use, improve your forage quality, improve soil health. So, you know, there's a danger that we get so caught up in the regulation that we miss the wider benefits of what's going on as well. So the starting point of this nitrogen management plan will be 170 limit and that 250 limit based on manure. Um, it will include the amount that's going on on each field and then the amount of fertilizer that we need to top up with. As a minimum, um, we need to have fields identified where, where manure, manure can go. Um, and we, we need to keep this record um, for at least five years to say you know, what went on in the farm in terms of where, where manure and fertilizer went. There's an exemption for the, for the little guys. Um, so again, if you can um, prove that 80% of the, the holding is, is grass and your total organic manure, you know, we were talking about 250, if you can get under the 100, then there's a, there's a um, less requirement for paperwork. And if your average um, fertilizer ex doesn't exceed 90 kilos of N. All right, you're doing all the paperwork to prove that. In reality, I'd probably, you know, say do your full recording anyway. There's not a huge step in it. Okay, in terms of what goes into a plan, the farm risk map. I haven't we done that? Here we go. Right, manure spreading plan. All we need to do is calculate the manure volumes you've got on farm. So that's animal numbers times the volumes, which are all in the tables, plus your rainfall. Um, and then we calculate the total nitrogen add in the exports, and then the maximum amount say, is, is up to 250. So it's quite a simple spreadsheet exercise to just say, how much shit do I produce? Where does it go? From an individual field plan, this is what they'd expect to see. Um, so I've got here a field, eight hectares. Um, it's going into three cut silage. And I've just run down what is gonna be applied in terms of three dressing to slurry, um, for a three cut system and the fertilizer is going in. Um, the crop recommendation is based on RB209. I'll run you through some of those figures in a minute. Um, and basically we add up to 268 kilos of nitrogen, slightly above what the book says, but you know, it's, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's certainly below any um, max limit. Um, it's slightly over, doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's close enough. And say so within a normal system, we have got a little bit of flexibility until we start hitting some, some of these maximum top ends. In terms of looking at the slurry, we've gone out with three dressings. Um, my slurry nitrogen comes in at 195, total nitrogen. So we're below my 250 limit. My nitrogen inputs from the bag and manure are, are limited at 300. So there's a whole table of max limits for different crops and grassland is at 300 with a slight allowance for an extra 40 from a multi-cut system. But this is an average across the whole farm. So theoretically on individual fields, if one went over, it doesn't necessarily matter as long as others come under. But these are the sort of figures that they'll want you to want to see for each individual field. What nitrogen is coming in from muck? What nitrogen is coming in from the bag? Are we all below the limits? I say, if you're struggling to sleep, RB29 is a great read. Um, these are the figures that I'm going to work on for grass. It's fairly simple. Um, we identify a yield bracket. So for most of you guys, you'll be in the 9 to 12, 12 to 15. Um, I don't see many farms that are anywhere close to getting to this sort of 300 tops. Most of the units currently operating are somewhere around the 250 Ks of N, which is about 200 units per acre. Again, for the grazing regimes, this is what the book says. I don't meet many people who follow what the book says, but in reality, very few are getting into the, the realms of more than 250 kilos of N. We're required to make an assessment of soil nitrogen supply. Um, RB209 does it for us in the, in the grassland context. 
um, and we, we move it into high, moderate or low, and there's a slight variation if you're in a high soil nitrogen supply regime, which would be fields that have had a history of high nitrogen inputs and lots of manure and slurry going in. Um, and all we do is, is we drop things by about 30 kilos of N. So we need to make an allowance for, for soil nitrogen. The previous example, mine went in at uh, a moderate, um, but it, it varies on um, rainfall and, and, and soil type. So things like forage maize and arable crops, it all gets a bit complicated. And I would love all this exercise to be something a farmer could do on the back of a fag packet. But once I get into some of the other crops, it really is gonna be a job for a man with a spreadsheet um, and, a, and a, a knowledge of his way around um, some computer software to make it easy. Um, in reality, we have to look through again at, at soil type and rainfall regimes, cropping history, manure history to come up with an allocation about whether or not I can put my maize field into a soil nitrogen supply index and nor or one or two. Um, there is an allowance for you to go and measure it yourself. <sighs> Don't go there. Um, it's a lot of hassle, and um, I think the books are. are book figures are all pretty accurate. I say the plan needs to be a working document. So I'd love it that every time the slurry contractor comes, you say, well, this is what we're doing and this is where it goes. And it should be something that we share. Now, so that all needs to be placed by January 2023. But I say be aware that that 170 kilo um, farm limit is based on your stocking regime effectively for 2022. And then as we move into towards 2024, um, as Keith says, it's, this is where the spreading periods come in and the spreading periods um, for grassland are gonna be, the no spread period is gonna run from 15th of October to 15th of January for most of you, um, slightly extended on, on shallow and sandy soils. And in that month of February, following the, the end of the closed period, you'll be limited to 30 Q per hectare with a three week gap before you can go again. Um, if you've got poultry manure, it's just, just about three tonne an acre. There is no closed period, as Keith says, for the spreading of the low available nitrogen manure, so less than 30% available nitrogen, things like solid manure. So we can still go out, but again, you've got to follow the rules about re avoiding risks of runoff. So this is where our field risk assessments come in. Don't go into your buffer zones, don't go close to watercourses, don't go on the slopes. Um, if you do, we've got to incorporate it. But effectively, the more that we've got is stackable, um, the more flexibility we've got in the whole manure system. <sighs> there is, for some bizarre reason, an exemption for the organic guys. Um, I haven't got my head around this at all. Nobody's explained why on earth this should be in place, but there we go. Um, theoretically, organically, I can nip out in October with some slurry. Um, please help me. I don't know why, but that's, that exists. Okay, the regs are there, but I say we, we can't just blindly go into regulation without recognising that there will be some return on investment coming back our way from improved use of, of muck and slurry. And if we just look at the current value of some of the manures we're dealing with, you know, slurry, every thousand gallons worth 18 quid, um, a tonne of farmyard manure worth about 11 quid, a tonne of poultry manure, 30 quid. Now, I know there's the stuff being sold, um, certainly poultry manure, 10, 15 pound a tonne, no problem. The actual value is quite high. So we need to think about making the most all the time of what we've got. Um, I say people really value their fertilizer because it's 280 pound a tonne. And I think we need to you know, consciously think about how much we've got in slurry and make sure we do value it as well. Based on the value, um, and if we think about where we're going to put it, we can then make savings in terms of P's and K's. I'm doing a lot of nutrient management plans at the minute with fields that are all at index threes, not silly high, but certainly plenty of scope for reducing fertilizer back from 25.55 to straight N. Um, so, you know, in this example, you work, you can work through um, and, and it's, it's all for a savings. So yeah, if I switch from um, MPK fertilizer to straight N, um, I, you know, I start making savings and also there's all the re re restrictions on if I'm not spreading in the winter, I'm not damaging my soil. I've got more earthworm activity. That, you know, so th there's lots of add on benefits we get from having a closed period in place and about putting slurry where it's needed. 
Um, a little figure here, just on looking at nitrogen availability. So if we are storing slurry um, for four months, five months, to, to take us through that period so that we're no longer spreading in autumn, we're now spreading in spring, um, I can improve my nitrogen recovery. All right, not a, a huge amount, but it still starts saving. And OK, I'm up £700 a year by being able to recover more nitrogen by not spreading through that winter period and being able to go out in, in February um, and March. So again, it, it's just about those, those sort of small savings that can then have an, a net impact on how much fertiliser we bring on the farm as well. OK, the additional implications, I'm sorry, but there's going to be increased pressure on your contractors, certainly pre and post closed period everybody's going to be chasing um their costs are going to go up they've got three four months of, of downtime as such i would ur urge you all to have a written contractor with your slurry guys think about the idea of investing in maybe some of your own kit um you know if i've got a three thousand um ga gallons an acre limit through february it might be something that you know you could think about maybe getting a tanker to do some of that um just to spread the, the, the risk effectively of a contractor not getting to you. There is going to be some pressure on additional spreading land. So if you're do your sums early, so you can start thinking about taking on additional land if you need it. I say I worry about some of the issues of slurry contamination in silage crops. In what would have gone on currently, we'd have gone out on a nice sunny day in early January to spread slurry on a silage crop. If I can't do that, there's a risk then that my slurry contaminates either my early grazing or my silage ground. So more and more, I'd say, look at dribble bars and trailing shoes and the like. Um, and I say, just beware of some of these uh, potential biosecurity. It's very easy to say, oh, we'll export some slurry, but there are gonna be restrictions about what we can do that, particularly in some of the TB areas. Okay, so yeah, do the sums now. Have a look at the tables that Welsh Government have published on those categories for how much nitrogen an animal produces and have a look at your forage area um, and make sure that you're getting close to that 170 limit. As of today, I want you out looking at fields. Um, you know, you know me, in an ideal world, you'd be there with your soil thermometer and your spade. Um, you know, it might not be that detailed, but certainly we need to make those field assessments and put it in the diary that you've walked the farm, um, you've made a note and everything's fine. Um, the risk maps are going to come in, so we need to identify the areas on your farm and we need to create this spreading plan for both nitrogen fertiliser and nitrogen from manure manure by January 2023. And then long term, once we get into August 2024, um, we need to think about how we cope with those spreading closed periods in terms of, from my point of view, what it does to grassland management. OK, whistle stop tour. I could have done with another hour, Jamie. Yeah, and we may need to put several more in the diary, I think, over the next, uh, well, throughout the transition period then. But it's really helpful just to get an overview to try and set the scene and get up, get our heads around what the new regulations actually mean. We've had loads of questions come in, actually. Um, so I'll start with um, a couple. Um, you can decide who who answers yourselves but um start off with can the nitrogen management plan be part of a nutrient management plan so if a nutrient management plan also includes other nutrients as well as nitrogen is that okay definitely um the problem is getting one done so i would put my hand up now and say an awful lot of the nutrient management plans i've done in the past i've been focused on um P and K and pH and some broad guidelines on nitrogen. Probably not enough in there to pass through a, an MVZ inspection. So everything we're going to produce going forward has got to be tightened up to, yeah, to make sure it's compliant. Uh, the discussions are ongoing within Farm and Connect to make sure that everything we do produce is going to be useful in that sense. Because, um, yeah, there's no point in having one nutrient management plan and then going, oh, we need another one. Um, I've also had another one come in. How do we know what is considered to be a steep slope? Okay, so the I'll get this right. Is anything above one in five? 
which is 12 degrees or a 20% slope. So it's, it's one that you sit there and you can look at the contour lines on the on the maps and try and work things out. There is a man in an office who's got a computer program who can probably press a button and map your farm and tell you which areas are above um, one in five. I would say it's, it's the parts of the farm that I always get the EBGBs about driving on. It's the sort of part, those are the sort of slopes that you don't want to be on on a wet time and you'd be thinking about twin wheels. And those are the ones that I've always for years been saying to people, don't go there anyway, stop it. Don't spread somewhere flat. So it's, it's, it's all those sort of areas. One in five is, is a steep old slope. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, Chris, so another one. Something I've sat down and just with a, a highlighter pen, gone into fields and gone, okay, where are the slope, you know, the bad bits? And just with a highlighter pen on a field map, just go through and, and target those steeper areas. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, another one. Are farmers going to be allowed to use rain guns with the dirty water? So not slurry, but the, is it lightly fouled? I don't think so. I'll say I'm not 100% sure, but because of it's still, your lightly fouled still has a nitrogen content and there is still a risk of that volatilization that will go upwards. So I would think, and I will check it, but I would think that the rain guns are going to be a no no. Yeah, I think I'm still up in the air, Jim, at the moment. So okay. yeah, they can spread it. It's just how they spread okay. it. We aren't. <laughs> was that a joke? <laughs> up in the air. That's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then another one. So when we're thinking about rented land, particularly short term rented land. So, for example, um, dairy farmer rents silage ground for cutting only during the summer. Um, can they include that land in their calculations and who's responsible for the records of that land? So it's going to work both ways. So, yes, you need to have in that allocation that you are taking manure there. So you need to keep a record of how much manure goes over there. And then the guy who owns the land will then include that in his records that is coming in as an import. Yeah. So it has to work both ways. They're not after Weybridge tickets or anything like that. They're just after a fact that it's had manure. And if you say it's got 3,000 gallons an acre, then it has. It's just got to be recorded. That's all. Yeah. You know, they, they've got to have some sort of paper trail with it. OK. Um, Another one now relating to slurry separation. So yeah. if people are exporting separated solids, is there something in place that can help them calculate that split and where the, the nitrogen is? There are book figures for separated slurry material. Um, again, it's something we can test relatively cheaply. So it's about 45 quid for a, um, a nitrogen assessment of, of organic material. Um, you know, the good thing about separators is it's fairly consistent stuff, so it's not a difficult product to sample. The other thing to yeah. remember with that, though, the, the separated liquid is still slurry. Yeah. Okay, it's not lightly fouled, so that needs to be contained. You need five month storage for that. Okie doke, thank you. Um, right, the questions are coming in fairly thick and fast. So we've got another one about infrastructure then. So is a sealed piped ditch okay next to a slurry store, assuming that it is it is sealed? <laughs> yeah, um, if, it's an ex if it's an existing piped ditch and the slurry store's already there, Theoretically, yes, because that should have been passed anyway. NRW will also give an element of flexibility because you do get into some situations where you are you have no choice. It's got to go next to a, a ditch or which they will allow you to pipe, but you need to you need to talk it through with them or you need somebody to speak to them on your behalf to say, look, this this is where it's going, this is why it'll be protected. I know it's within 10 meters, but and you know, I, I've done loads over the years where yes, you've built the slurry store within 10 meters when there's no other option or nowhere else to go, yeah. Okay, we've got another one about ditches as well. So when does a hollow become a ditch? 
if yeah, it's got a funnel of water yeah, through right it. Count. Yeah. It's if it's got a flow of water through it, they'll regard it as a ditch or a water course, effectively. So, you know, would 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 you build anything in a hollow? So if if there's yeah, a flow yeah, rate of water through it, they'll regard months. it as a ditch. Yeah, if it's dry for eleven months. Yeah. You know, for 350 days but it does carry water at some point it is a ditch yeah it's a ditch yeah okay excellent um right another one here then so about the when the stocking rates are calculated so at what point of the year are animals actually counted Okay, we'll so yeah, it's it's an it's let's say it's a horrible setup with the spreadsheet. But basically, as from we need to have an annual inventory. So from the first of January, twenty twenty two, we need to think about everything that's on the holding for that next twelve months. So it's relatively easy when we've got mature cows. We can say, yeah, she's going to be here. So we tick her off in that box. Um, there's a little bit of complications when we start thinking about, well, hang on a minute, I've got young stock. Some of them are here for till they're eight weeks, some are here till they're eight months. But so basically you can, each individual animal will have a set time on farm before he goes and an allocation. So, you know, you divide your 10 month allocation of an animal that's in that box between three and 13 months. And if it goes off at eight months, then it's only gets half its allocation. So yeah, every individual animal, including your bulls, including the wife's horse, um, yep, they all go on there. Excellent, thank you. I think you've answered multiple questions in one there because we've got lots of people asking about things like, you know, if sheep come onto the holding temporarily, does that have to count? Yep. So, so I can put my um, tax sheep in there for three months. They all have an allocation. Yeah. Okay, look, and. Another question about um, nitrogen fixing crops. Does the nitrogen from there get counted anywhere? Okay, there is an allocation in the soil nitrogen supply um, calculations for high clover swords, yes. Um, but not especially, no. Not in any major way. But I think it's, it's once you grow over 50%, they do allocate a, a different category for clover swords. Right. Okay, right. I think we'll we'll leave it there. I imagine that there will be many, many more questions that spring to people's minds sort of after the webinar and in the coming months as people start to um, try and make the adaptions required to, to comply with the regulations and as we move through the transition period. So... <laughs> Um, thanks, thanks both for your time today and thanks to everyone at home for listening. I really do hope that it's been useful. Um, do keep an eye on the AHDB Dairy website for further updates and particularly look for some of our business focused resources which might be helpful in running what if scenarios, those kind of things, scoping out ideas for the business planning. Um, particularly AHDB have a tool called a slurry wizard which might be helpful in helping you calculate what you've currently got um, storage wise um, etc so that's one really to have a look at um, and farming connect have also got lots of support available they've got one-to-one -one digital surgeries and their advisory service are offering confidential advice which is 80 percent funded or the group advice which is 100 percent funded specifically related to infrastructure advice nutrient management planning, but also to nitrogen management planning. Um, so for more information about that, obviously get in touch with Farming Connect Direct, um, either your local development officer, the service centre or the Farming Connect website. Um, and do look out for further AHDB support. Like I said, check out the Slurry Wizard. Um, make sure that you've got your copy of the RB209. Um, and I think that we'll we'll leave it there. Um, there are a few questions that we didn't quite answer. However, um, we will be putting 
frequently asked questions section onto the AHDB website. So it's really worth having a look there because that will answer quite a few of the questions that have come up. So we will be developing you know, a further package of support as we move through the transition period. So keep your eye out for that. Finally, huge thanks to our guest speakers today. Chris Keith, thank you so much. I know that you have spent many hours getting your head around the new regulations over recent weeks. Um, and I guess it's going to remain a work in progress for us all throughout the transition period. Um, but your support really is needed and gratefully received. So thank you very, very much. Okay. And to everyone else, thanks for listening. I hope you have a lovely Easter weekend. Bye for now. Bye.